Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us, Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to our online worship here at Swamp Luther Church for the sixth Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, we are looking for some a couple of announcements as we begin. Uh, looking for some volunteers to do a variety of things. Uh, one of the needs we have are for folks who are able to drive others to various appointments, bring them to church on Sunday. If you're able to do that, give us a call here at the church and we'll put you on the list as potential drivers. We're also looking for what I guess we might want to call property angel volunteers. Folks who want to adopt a little part of the church property, take care of it, keep things clean, maybe pull some weeds in a particular bed around the uh, property. If that's something that you think you can do and feel called to do, let also give us a call here at the church and let us know. There's also some food pantry donations needed. Check your online uh, bulletin for details about the items that are needed for that. We're also collecting for the Lutheran World Relief School Kit Project, and uh, those details are also in your bulletin. Hospitalizations and health concerns. I ask that you keep my niece, Alicia Brubaker, in your prayers. She uh, recently was diagnosed with uh, some dissections of her carotid artery. And so now she's on a six-week plan of rest and relaxation and recuperation while those are supposed to heal on their own through a regimen of medication. So that's a little scary. So hopefully all goes well there with Alicia. Also, Nettie Kreiner, uh, her medical conditions are such that she caused her a hospital stay uh, this, this week. So Nettie is John Franz's sister. We want to keep Nettie in our prayers as well. Birthdays this week. On Monday, Greta Higgins. Tuesday, Andrew Hagee. Wednesday, Jason Hershey. Friday, Jeff Lead. And Saturday, Luke Zook. And now we begin our worship service by singing hymn number 853, When Morning Gilds the Skies, verses 1 and 5. <laughs> Eternal God, you draw near to us in Christ, and you make yourself our guest. Amid the cares of our lives, make us attentive to your presence, that we may treasure your word above all else, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Our first reading today is from Genesis, the 18th chapter. The Lord visits Abraham and Sarah to tell them that the long-awaited promise of the birth of a child will be fulfilled for them in their old age. The lesson reads, The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, I find, if you find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, then wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, 
Make ready quickly three measures of choice, flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before him, before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. The word of the Lord. Thanks be, Thanks be to, God. to God. Our second reading is from the first chapter of Colossians. This letter offers a mystical teaching that the great mystery of God is Christ in you. Because Christ is present in the church, Christians share in his life, suffering, and glory. The epistle reads, Christ Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things held together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith, without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is he whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 10th chapter. Glory to glory you, to you O Lord. Lord. During his visit to the home of Mary and Martha, Jesus reminds Martha that her concern for her many tasks distracts her from the one thing that precedes all else, abiding in the presence of God. The Gospel speaks. Now as Jesus and his disciples went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Mary was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part which will not be taken away from her. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, to you Lord Christ. Christ. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable and suitable in your sight, O God, our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Poor Martha. You know, she's trying to do her best to serve her guests and when she seeks the help of her sister, well, Jesus rebuffs her. I kind of feel sorry for her. And this scene, well, it reminds me of holiday dinners in my family tradition. The women and the older girls, well, they did most, if not all, of the holiday preparation work. 
The men and boys, well, they ate, they joked, and then they retreated to the living room to watch the game, while the women and girls again cleaned up. Some very traditional and patriarchal gender roles at work here. Now, of course, that never stopped my mom on any given day from inviting me to wash the dishes after dinner. I recall as she would say, now, Scotty, you may wash the dishes. Of course, I'm thinking, gee, Mom, thanks. You know, you're just way too good to me. I never thought you'd ask. Ah, but that was my mom. Never subtle, no matter how clever her tactics were. Of course, over the years, I have learned, due to my mother's instigation, that I've come to appreciation of the lesson for all of us, that regardless of our gender, there is a need to pitch in with work around the house. Nevertheless, when it came to those big family holiday meals, when other relatives would join us, those old patriarchal norms would prevail. And so when I read our story today, I can't help but imagine that if Jesus were a guest at my family holiday dinners of yesteryear, he might just say to my mom, why don't you chill out with the kitchen work and come watch the game, sit with your sister in the living room. And maybe that is what Jesus would say, but you know, from our text today, I think there is a much deeper meaning here than just that. Because it's not primarily about breaking the boundaries of gender roles because Martha is cooking and her sister Mary is listening to Jesus. Now granted, Jesus is breaking barriers in that Mary has assumed the role, excuse me, has assumed the role reserved for males in his society who were the only ones who were allowed to be taught by Jewish rabbis. And further, the fact that Mary is hosting this dinner in her home under the supervision of no one but herself, no man, well, that breaks social barriers of the day as well. But nevertheless, the uniqueness of this story is that the conflict appears to be between Mary and Martha, between the role of hostess and student, between serving and learning, not between gender roles. And what we see is Jesus privileging Mary over Martha, learning over serving, and so, on the surface, one might conclude that the work of hospitality and service is simply not important. But this seems to contradict Jesus' teaching in the very verses prior to our story today. You see, last week, Jesus is teaching about the Samaritan, the Good Samaritan. We studied it last week. And from that parable, we learned that neighborly service to others, particularly those in need, is the hallmark of discipleship. So service is clearly highly valued by Jesus. So consequently, I think that Jesus, as he usually does, is giving us another perspective on discipleship in our text today. I think, therefore, we need to consider both the Good Samaritan and our story today as part of a larger whole. Because in both cases, we see that both the lawyer and Martha have trouble hearing the word of God, but for different reasons. I suspect that we can and should learn from each. Now I note, interestingly, how Jesus breaks down these social barriers, talked about it before, but he broke it down in different ways because you have to note that both the Samaritan and Mary are socially disqualified from being models of anything, anything good, according to the norms of first century Jewish Palestinian culture. The Samaritan, because, well, he's an outsider, he's an other. Mary, because she is a woman, considered to be little more than property, you know, to make babies and do housework. And yet both are presented here as images of the kingdom which Jesus brings. Both types are needed to complete the discipleship for which Jesus calls, to hear God's word, and then to do it. In short, the Samaritan embodies love for the neighbor. Mary embodies love for God, love of God and love of neighbor. That's the whole of the law and the prophets that Jesus talks about. So just what does Martha have wrong here that requires Jesus to correct her? A couple things. 
First, this problem with Martha is not in her serving, but rather that she is worried and distracted. It's helpful to note that the root meaning of the word worry is strangled or seized by the throat and tear. The root meaning of distraction is a separation or a dragging apart of something that should be whole. Martha, therefore, is in a state of fragmentation, and it prevents her from the most important aspect of hospitality, and that is being attentive to the guest. It seems Martha is more concerned about impressing her guest than in being the company, being in the company, and in relationship with her guest. Further, she seems to be so fixated on herself and her problems that she tries to enlist Jesus in taking her side in her jealous dispute with her sister. You see, Mary longs to sit with Jesus just like Mary, and she's kind of miffed that her sister is not helping with the meal. And so she confronts Jesus by saying, Lord, don't you care that Mary has left me to do all the work here? Why don't you tell her to help me? You know, it's the classic tactic of triangulation, where you attempt to draw somebody else in on your side of the dispute. But you know, Jesus sees right through it, and he refuses to play Martha's game. Instead, he gently rebukes her for her distracted fixation on serving Jesus when, in fact, Jesus is providing the one thing that's needed, indeed is the one thing needed. After all, he is the one who came to serve, not to be served. And so Mary here is the sister who chose to receive Jesus' teaching as the gift that cannot be taken away. And she is a model for all of us. Now, in defense of Martha, she certainly means well. But she's operating under the constraints of her cultural norms that cause her, not, cause her to not recognize how Jesus is the host wherever he is. And so folks, today our story is guidance on loving God as God intends us to do. That is to feast on God's word so that we are prepared to go and love our neighbor. Do you now see how the Samaritan and Mary reflect the two main thrusts of the great commandment, to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves? Have you ever noticed that our worship service liturgy follows this same framework? I mean, if you take a look in your bulletin, you will notice that our liturgy, which literally means work of the people, well, it has four main parts. The first part, the gathering part, is where we begin. We prepare ourselves by confessing our sin and receiving God's forgiveness. The second part, the word part, is where we are nourished by God's word in scripture, preaching, and song. And the third part, in the meal, we are fed with the presence of Jesus Christ in the bread and wine. And then lastly, in the sending part of our service, after having been prepared and nourished to do God's work, we are blessed and we're sent into the world to be the church of Christ, loving our neighbors as ourselves in our everyday lives. And so, as we contemplate the lessons for today, in the larger context of the greatest commandment to love God and love our neighbor, might we also hear Jesus' words to Martha as the invitation that it is. An invitation to sit where Mary sat, to take delight in Jesus' words, to surrender our heavy burdens to him, and allow Jesus to host us. An invitation extended to us here in worship each and every week. Remember, folks, as Jesus said, there is need of only one thing. And if we choose it, no one can ever take it away from us. So go ahead and choose it. Choose to be here and worship each week, knowing that Jesus, our host, is waiting here for you. Because that, my friends, is the good news in Jesus Christ. For us today and every day. And so now may the peace that surpasses our human understanding keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. And now united in Christ and guided by the Spirit, 
We pray for the church, the creation, and all in need. Ever-present God, in Christ you fill all things. As your church gathers to hear your word, share your meal, and receive your blessing, teach us to welcome strangers as we have been welcomed by you. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Through Christ you created all things visible and invisible. Teach humankind to honor and protect all creation, including living things that remain hidden from our eyes, such as air, atmosphere, molecules, and microscopic creatures. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Through Christ you reconcile all things. Motivate those in power to end enslavement, dehumanization, or brutality of any kind, and to protect and improve the lives of indigenous peoples. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Through Christ you bring peace. Assure all who are worried and distracted by many things of your constant presence. Soothe those suffering in mind, body, or spirit. Sustain all who are afflicted and those who serve as caregivers. We pray especially for those on our prayer list and all those we name before you now, either aloud on our lips or silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. In Christ, you make your word fully known. Inspire this worshiping community at Swamp Lutheran to abide fully in your word as we sit at the feet of Jesus. Bless the ministry of teachers and Bible study leaders. Bless the vacation Bible school teachers who will lead our children this week. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. In Christ, you brought forth the firstborn from the dead. We give thanks for the saints you have gathered at your table. Gather us with them into your eternal glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. God of every time and place, in Jesus' name and filled with your Holy Spirit, we entrust these spoken prayers and those in our hearts into your holy keeping. Amen. Amen. And now gather together as one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our, our Father, Father in, in heaven, heaven, hallowed be your name. Your, your kingdom come, your, your will be done God, on earth as in heaven. heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now receive God's blessing as you go out to be the church in the world. The God of peace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you, comfort you, and show you the path of life, this day and always. Amen. Amen. And now we will conclude our worship by singing hymn number 636, How Small Our Span of Life, verses 1 and 4. <laughs> Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm.